Welcome back to the Tim and Steve Show. I'm Tim Beard. Steve Morris. Chief Wilmot. What's going on? How are you? I'm good. How are you? You're looking dapper. Thank you. I've got a presentation this evening. You do? Yeah. Uh, you prepared and all ready for yeah, that? Yeah, ready to roll. Yep. Unlike me and Steve that nope. are... Sorry, bud. Not usually... Uh, yeah, you guys me, playing footsies. Myself. Myself. I'll yeah. play footsies with Tim so the guest is comfortable. So you're going to make me uncomfortable? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Oh, you make everybody uncomfortable. So. <laughs> it's the muscle shirts, tank tops. Yeah, it's hot out. At least he's rocking the Red Sox, you know? Yeah, I get the That's right, thing. Red Sox. What is, that, what is that hat? Is that appropriate for air? Yeah, it's from um, Texas. A lot of people think it's from the Alamo, but it's from another fort or town where they were like, come and take my cannon. And they tried. Bring it, yeah. yeah and they, Eat your Wheaties, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. these things are heavy. Good luck Eat moving Eat your Wheaties, them. but don't fall asleep underneath a tree in San Jacinto, or we'll capture you all, because that's, you know, that's, that's ultimately what happened. Yeah. They were taking a nap, and Sam Houston marched right into their camp and captured them. This is after the Alamo. I know this story very well, because they do three or four years of Texas history in Texas, and I lived right next to... To San Jacinto. My dad used to swim in the San Jacinto River. There's little islands out there that used to have like wild horses. I think he said they used to find old pistols and stuff from the old days. That's pretty cool. I could have dreamt that up though. So if I'm wrong, my dad Listen, and mom will none of our listeners are going to know. Tomorrow. Just roll with it. No, but I, I, I remember that as a kid, like those stories. And the San Jacinto Monument was right by our house. Not right by, but in Texas, everything's right by if it's not an hour drive. So it's less than an hour away. Like thirty minutes, nice. From where I lived, whenever like when we moved, but when before the third grade, we lived in Channel View, which is right by San Jacinto. Nice. Anyway, little Texas history. I, yeah, I can't I like believe it. I can't remember the name of the town that it's from. I just talked about it with my uncle because my brother's like, yeah, from the Alamo. And my uncle corrected him. That's on the tip of my tongue. I'll look it up while y'all talk. Cool. I don't like not knowing this. And as soon as I find it, I'm going to be mad at myself. So you got – now what was the name of it? I keep saying active shooter training, but it was a different name. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's what it is really, right? It's right. So um, we call it active shooter or active attacker. It's The, the program is um, CRACE, so civilian response to active shooter events, um, targeted violence, I mean, all, all of that stuff. So, yeah, it's a – we took the active shooter program and I think I may have said this before on air, but, um, it's AC. It's all good. Okay. I don't know if we had a choo-choo train coming through. Nah. So yeah, battle of Gonzalez. Sorry. Oh, no, sorry. Thanks for doing the research, man. So basically what, what the, the national average is three minutes response time for police officers from the time of the, they receive the call until the time that they get on scene for an active shooter event. And so the, the training is focused on what civilians should do in that period of time between when something starts and when something ends. However, um, you would think that we would spend the whole presentation talking about that, but the reality is I think the majority of the presentation is spent talking about other things. So... And I've sort of tried to tailor it to Newport and the unique things about Newport. So we talk a lot about um, prevention. We talk a lot about uh, threat management and threat assessment and what Newport School is doing, what the police department in Newport is doing and the fire department and EMS, what we're doing here, what the state is doing to try to sort of mitigate threats to um, – to identify the threats that, that are there, um, how, how we can communicate to the public to be, they use this word not, not about a bystander, but as an upstander. So, you know, I think, who was it? Was it not Homeland Security? Who, who came up with see something, say something? Was that Homeland Security? Yeah, it was right after 9-11. Yeah. yeah, it was shortly after 9-11. With but, like the whole color code chart type Yeah, thing. but suffice it to say... Um, Sort of those principles hold true, and and we talk about different behaviors and um, different things that people may notice in other folks that you know they might be uncomfortable sharing that, but um, it's it's good to share that type of information so we can get out ahead of, ahead of a problem. And then we will talk about like what is a you know what is a, a threat assessment or a threat management 
team unit multidisciplinary uh, unit look like? I think a lot of people think, well, it's the police or it's the school, and yes, that's a component of it. But there's a lot of other components that that we could have um, to address these problems because we we know that they're not just school problems. We know that they're not just you know criminal justice problems. There are social problems. There are substance abuse problems. Sometimes mental health problems. And I'm not just talking about school shootings. I'm talking about like targeted violence in general. And there's all kinds of things that contribute to it. And when you start to approach it from all angles, you're, you're more apt to have a better outcome. So we do that. We talk a little bit about psychology and physiology and things that people will experience if they're under stress and why that's important to know in advance. And again, I've said it last week that I was in here. We don't, we don't rise to the occasion. We fall back on our training and we talk about some people who have who have done that um, in different scenarios. Sully, the the, uh, Captain Sullenberger, uh, Rick Rascorla, who was the director of corporate security for Morgan Stanley, um, Lieutenant Brian Murphy from Oak Creek, Wisconsin Police Department. So we we start to, we go into a couple different examples of like real heroes and um, what they did. And at the end of the day, you know, if you knew that tomorrow you had to fight for your life, how would you train today, right? And so that's what it comes down to. Interestingly enough, I watched a uh, podcast uh, over the weekend, a guy by the name of Earl Plumley. Is that name ring a bell to you? He's, mm-hmm. he's actually currently still on active duty in the Army. He was a fairly recent um, Medal of Honor winner for action in Afghanistan. What was really interesting about about his story is um, when he was doing his interview, one of the hosts asked him, like, how did this compare to your training? You know, how did this particular battle compare to the, the training that you'd received? Now, he's a Green Beret, so, like, he's received training that's probably a little bit more advanced than, you know, your regular big army infantrymen. But he said, you know, looking back on it, it's like, it was exactly like a, like a, a, a training evolution. It, it, nothing was different. It was exactly like what he expected a training evolution to be like, f- you know, from having to transition to different weapon systems during the battle to, um, you know, shooting and moving to cover and, um, you know, just just all the different things tactically that you have to think about on the battlefield and the things that he had been trained over the course of the years. When he When he was confronted with the wolf and he he fell back on training and he survived and you know for his actions he was awarded the congressional medal of honor so yeah i feel like it's it's something that we shouldn't have to talk about in schools or even in society but the reality is we we have to because it's just it is our reality now unfortunately and um it's like i was had a meeting with uh miss martin last week and Obviously, I talked a little bit about the safety stuff, and I'm like, obviously, you're not going to share your your plans and everything with us because it's not something you want to make public. Like, you don't want to, you know, here, this is what they're going to do. But, you know, with the new CTE, for instance, security is something they're very concerned about. We want it to look nice and everything, but in their mind still, okay, we, we have an auto shop people come into. We have the salon, so we need to be conscious of you know, making sure that we can keep track of the people coming in the school. And um, and it sucks that we have to talk about these things. But I feel like, like you said, if you're not prepared, then what are you going to do? You're just going to panic, right? But if right. you're like, hey, I remember the night I went to chief's class here and I learned something and now I can be a better citizen because I can make smart decisions and not be right. part of the issue and right. panic and whatever. So. Yeah, I mean, Benjamin Franklin, I think, was quoted as saying an ounce of preparation is worth a pound of cure. Um, and it's, it, it, for me, it's true. Like the, the more prepared you are, you, you may, you may learn something that you may only need to know one time in your life, but it could save your life because you had that knowledge. Right. So, um, we have talked about before, um, the OODA loop and John Boyd and, uh, you know, John Boyd being, a, an air force officer pilot and, you know, he, he studied, Everything he studied, you know, physics and um, math and all, and all different types of fields. He just he was the consummate lifelong learner, and the reason for that is 
the more you know. <laughs> when the situation changes, you've already got something in your library that you can call upon. And um, it's not going to fundamentally disrupt your OODA loop. And so that's the goal here. It's not necessarily to make us all war fighters or, you know, but it's to make us start thinking about things and maybe start researching or, and at the end of the day, if, if we are able to change one or two people's way of thinking, I think it's successful. And, and that's the way it is. And, and I think as you look at like, particularly threat management and threat assessment, and you say like, okay, well, let's take, you know, let's take a group of, let's say 10 people, right? And if you think in your mind of like the 10, 10 of the people with whom you grew up who were like, really bad, always got in trouble, always got in fights. They were, you know, violent people, right? If, if, if you were in a group of professionals and you had to help mitigate and manage those risks and, and try to sort of steer them into a different way, you might not catch them all. In fact, you probably won't catch them all. Um, and there are some that are still going to have bad outcomes, but it doesn't mean that we don't try. And if we can have success with one or two, maybe that one or two, we could prevent a disaster, right? So you can eat an elephant and you just have to do it one bite at a time. And I, I think that it's, it's worth, a, it's a noble cause and it's worth our effort. Yeah. So that's tonight, 530 to 830. Yep. Opera house. Yep. No charge. No open charge. To anybody come open to anybody. I, uh, somebody asked me today, isn't it, you can have a bar? No, I'm not having a bar. Um, everybody's welcome to bring water or whatever, but I'm not serving alcohol at a PD-sponsored <laughs> program about active shooter and, and whatever else. Wow. I think it was just an ingest, so. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so the news of the day. Yep. I'm so sad about. Oh, don't be sad. But I'm happy for you. I, yep. I truly am happy for you, even yep. though I'm sad for my selfish self, Newport, but... You're uh, going to be the new chief in Claremont. I am. And uh, that came out last night, so we'll be looking for a new chief in Newport. Uh, but no, I truly, I am truly happy for you as a, I consider you a friend. And uh, it's tough because you are, like, you think, I personally, I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm selfish, though, because I want him to stay in Newport. Like, we've got a good chief. And Yeah, Newport's but, a great town, man. It's it's awesome. I, 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 I've been saying this for the last, I don't know how long, but like, it was a bumpy ride when I got here. You know, it was, it, it took a while for me to get my feet on the ground for, for a variety of reasons. I think part of that was because I'm, I'm not from Newport. I didn't have the same connections that say Chief Burroughs had, or, um, you know, others that have sort of grown up through the, through, through the town or through the department. I, I didn't have the same connections here that I had in Claremont when I was there. So it took me a little while to like get my feet on the ground. We also went through COVID and, so, so like not only am I being a, a brand new chief, but I'm I'm doing it in a time that nobody knows what the heck they're doing and in a new town and so it took a while and um it's still taking a while. I'm not I, by by no means now am I um necessarily good at what I'm doing, but um I, I've definitely started to learn little tricks and little secrets and I I definitely feel like I'm getting my feet on the ground and um you know developing more support in the community and, and so on and so forth. And I can't say enough for like what, what this town does. I mean, it's, it's, dude, it's epic, you know, from, from like dancing with the stars to green up, clean up to, you know, the events that happen on the common winter carnival to the, the pride that the community takes and, and their tigers and, you know, sporting events and parades when we have victories and it's just, it's epic and I've never seen it anywhere else. And I'm so happy to be a part of it. And I've made so many good relationships in my time here. So there's zero part of me that's leaving here because I'm on, un, I'm unhappy here. In fact, um, I'm super happy here. And if it didn't, if, if it hadn't gone in that direction, if the police commission hadn't selected me to be the police chief in Claremont, then I would be totally happy being in Newport and I could ride out the rest of my career here and be very, very happy. And, and, you know, sort of set goals and try to achieve them and all that, all that good stuff. But, um, at the end of the day, um, you know, Claremont is my home. Right. It's uh, your hometown. It's my hometown. I'm a, I'm a second generation Claremont cop. You know, my dad, uh, started working for the city in 1980. He worked there full time until 2005 and retired as the deputy chief. 
Um, I started three months after he left. Three months after he left, I started working there full time. And, you know, in high school, I was you know, towards the end of high school, but um, I was part of the Explorer program. I went to the Cadet Academy. My senior year of high school, I dispatched part time. You know, so like, I don't. By no means was it was this a foregone conclusion. But you know, if if you look back with the, with hindsight being twenty twenty, um, it certainly looks like this has been my tra trajectory for a long, long time. You know, this has been been the goal. So, I I am excited to uh, go home. Yeah. Well, we want to thank you for <laughs> yeah. your service to Newport, and uh, you're obviously a great addition. And um, the nice thing is, you are just going one town over. Correct. And uh, I'm sure you work with Claremont as the chief now constantly, and Claremont works with Newport all the time. And yeah, uh, because a lot of your cases, I'm sure, overlap and all that kind of stuff. But they do, uh, but not as much as I think I thought. Really? Yeah. 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 Um, it's weird, you know, I know tribalism sometimes is kind of a dirty word, right? But it's it's just weird when I left, um, you don't, when you're in it um, over there, you don't, I don't think, I don't think you necessarily like pop your head up and look around as much because it's, there's, there's a lot going on, you know? Um, but over here in Newport, um, I think you're, I think we're our head is up a little bit more. I think we're we're looking around and um, it it's just a little bit different. Um, Claremont kind of has always just sort of stuck to their own, just because they they have a few more people. They don't have to rely on outsiders quite as much. And I think here in Newport, I think we just have to we have to rely on other people a little bit more than I had to over there. And it was so it's a little bit of an adjustment. And um, but again. I, once I got out of that system over there and came over here and I was able to look at it from afar, it's like, ooh, wow. <laughs> you know, that's – it's different. It's different over here than it, than it was over there. So, yeah. Didn't angle my feet further enough. Yeah, further sorry, further. man. Sorry. <laughs> hey, I'm, just, I'm mad at myself for not getting Gonzalez. I knew it started with a G. I just didn't want to – Dude, are you on. perseverating over that? Oh, I am. Do you see what I'm talking about, this whole Morris thing where they're like, <laughs> got to be this? He's still thinking about that. Oh, you're sad you're leaving. He's like, oh, I'm sad remember. too. I'm happy though. Like I, I talked nah, about no. it with Zeta because Zeta wrote. I think I told you earlier before yeah. the show had written me. I was like, why is Chief leaving? And uh, it's awesome for your family. It's legacy. It's yeah. you know, it's history for your family at least, if not yeah. for the town. Just the yeah. and mom and dad live in Newport now. They do. So it's not like <laughs> yeah. you're going far, anyways. And they do. Uh, dad was what select board, right? Yep, he was, and they they're still involved. I mean, my mom works at the school. She's she works in the guidance office. My my parents my have been. I think my dad is currently on the library advisory board. Your uh, dad should apply for school board. There's an opening. There is now. There is now. Mm -hmm. One uh, resigned last. Meeting. I don't know if you'll see that out of him, um, <laughs> but I don't know. I think his time on boards like that maybe maybe over. But who knows? You know. Yeah, we all have something left to give, probably. He'd be good. Maybe you're just getting a plug in, though, since we didn't do it on the show earlier. What school board? School board vacancy. Well, I mean, we don't have to talk about it every day, but That's yeah. True. What else is going on? That's about it, man. That's kind of sort of dominating the space right now. She'll so be uh, here through July. Sometime yeah, I, in July. You're not sure. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. They still have to do my background. I. Should come back clean, but uh, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess if it comes I, back bad, you'd be like, "Oh, I'll just stay in Newport." Yeah, no, <laughs> I think it'll come back clean. So it'll never catch on to that bank job or anything, but, right? So uh, yeah, no, they, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I got to work that out with the town manager, and we got to talk about succession and and the, those types of things. But today, today has been a day. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready for this presentation, so I, I met with the school this morning and. Um, sort of, we had a we had a discussion. We talked about certain things, and it's just been a lot. It's just been a lot going on. A lot going on. There's so. a lot of turnover going on in the town this summer. That's true. Change. Change. Yeah. Not always good, but it's not always bad either. I heard I heard recently that it's not change that people don't like. It's being changed. So, like, if you decide to go on, a, did I say this before on air? So like I don't know if I did or not. So if I did, if I have, then, then stop me. But like, if you decide, I want to start 
a diet or I'm going to start a, a workout regimen and you and you go from whatever you were onto that regimen, that's not hard for you. I mean, it, it might be difficult to some degree, but psychologically, you've made that decision, so you're you're good with that. But if someone says to you, "Hey, Steve, guess what? You're going on only a juice cleanse," and you haven't made that decision, that's when it's hard. So yeah, it's but... being changed that's hard. It's not changed necessarily. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, uh, I would... especially for me, I don't like being told what to do. So I, it's, I don't know. I, I can't. So rich it. with irony, considering I know, what your like, life has been like. The my brother, I, th- I think I said it on the air and to you, is can't believe that I survived twenty years in the regular army, because my personality is for like special ops, like give me in a task and leave me alone. But like the more you talk to me, the more defiant I get. I, Which I like it comes I like, across as like cockiness or arrogance yeah. because I was told maybe in my younger army days that my confidence in myself was bordering on arrogance or whatever. But it's I love like, how how they use that word. That word is used when it's like a positive, like, "Wow, Tim, you're a very confident guy." But like, Tim, you're cocky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like where's the line? I've exactly. never really figured out the line. It's like somewhere, you know? somewhere in between where yeah. I was as a captain, and I, maybe still whenever I retired. But, I might have been the same, but... So have you all watched Top Gun 3, 2? Not yet. Oh, okay, man. You've I've seen it, three, what, three times? Three times <laughs> now? So I want to say this one thing. So there's a scene in the beginning of the movie where they're in a bar. And I read this article about how they filmed the movie. And when they're in the bar, they're, they're just... You can... You just sense, like, just how arrogant they are. Like, these naval aviators, you know, like... And I prob- you probably had interfaced with some over the course of your career, right? Like, oh, I land on a boat, uh, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> I've never landed on a boat, FYI. Yeah, so I probably couldn't do it. I so, couldn't but do it I, don't ha- I, don't, I don't have the ability to pick on them. But Somewhere I'm- between cocky and confident, though? Or just oh, no, cocky. full send cocky. Full. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, but <clears throat> you can sense it in the movie that they're like super cocky, super arrogant when they're inside this bar. Well, what's interesting is in the making of that movie, they actually had the cast flying in F-18s. And they had put – this is part of the reason why it's so – it's such a good movie because they had um, cameras inside the, the airplanes. Now, they weren't flying them. They had actual naval, naval aviators flying the airplanes, but they were in the back seat and watching their face and stuff like that. So they would run these missions and get all these um, – all this tape and all this film and stuff like that. Well, towards the end of shooting for the movie, they all like had like a, a swagger, you know what I mean? Because they had done it and they'd gone through Tom Cruise had actually set up like a, like a flight training program. So they started out like learning the, you know, the aeronautics of flight and, you know, lift and all the different principles about how, like, like why planes fly. And so he got them up in Cessnas first and then they sort of graduated up until they were in F-18s pulling like real G's and stuff. They went back and they reshot that scene after they had shot all the scenes of them in the air when they had that like confidence and swagger. And because they were like, we, we got to do this one over because – these guys, they've got it now. You know what I mean? So they went back and shot it. You can, you can feel it, you know? That's cool. Yeah. You have to check out this movie. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for it to come onto the TV. Steve. You're so cheap. Go to the theater, dude. You know why he's hesitant to go? Because if it was they only accepted cash, he'd be like, yeah, Tim, we should go. Because he <laughs> never has cash on him. And I always pay when he, <laughs> we go somewhere. But he's like, card. Yeah, I know. Yeah, they take here. a card there. Yeah. They take a card. Oh, I, I, is cool. it played in Claremont? I probably. I'm I just sure watched it. Everywhere. I watched it twice in Claremont, once in Lebanon. Lebanon's theater is cool. Lebanon's very nice now. They redid yeah. it. The, the Cozy cool. seats. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's very it's nice. It's good, man. It's like it sitting in your house on your couch. Nicer. Or more. better because you got like food right there available for you that you don't have to make or clean up. That's, That's true. true. That's very true. I used to go to the movies quite a bit. Like I have movie posters, like Big Tube over there. There's 50 movie posters that I've purchased. There's another one somewhere in here with another 50. I love movies. Like I, There's not many movies that you can stump me on. Maybe from before 1977, yeah, you probably could stump me. But since then, unless it's an art house flick, because I don't watch that garbage. Like, What is that? 
uh, something that you would see on focus films, you know, like some seriously drab thing where there's drama involved. I need, like, I don't, if I, I there's enough drama in life, yeah, why well, go yeah. watch somebody else's? You yeah, know what I mean? Like, right. I want to escape reality and enjoy myself for an hour and a half to three hours, however long the movie is, and just immerse myself in that world. Right. And so I don't like watching a lot of art house garbage. It's not my my thing. But over the last, I don't know, five years, I've kind of tailored back my movie watching. Yeah, we didn't. I don't. I don't know. I don't go to much. I don't go to the theaters as much anymore. But I think maybe maybe over the last few months we've been on an uptick. It started with episode eight for me. If you want to know the truth, when they ruined Luke Skywalker for good. In Star Wars. Okay. I wanted to walk out of the theater, but Zeta was with me, so I didn't walk out. Do you know I, what I'm talking about? Have you nope. seen, you know, watch No, Star I'm not Wars? a Star Wars guy. I did, I did when I was in high school, get in the long line for the midnight showing of the fourth Star yeah. Wars. What is that? Uh, not Attack it, of the Clones. It was the first with one. Anakin it was as the a kid. It was the first one that they, like, re, redid. The prequels. Yeah, the first prequel. So that was 1999? Yeah. Yeah, senior year, I think. Junior year or whatever. I did that midnight showing. Hmm. But I think that's I, the only one I've ever watched. Really? Well, anyway. Are when I was Wars a child, guy? Star Wars, 1977 Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi were my three go-to films to escape reality. Like, it was just... I don't know. It was cathartic for me. I literally <laughs> ruined the VHS tape watching Star Wars so much. My granny had recorded it on Showtime or whatever. And so I had ruined the tape. I'd watched it so many times. So you, uh, do you still like it? The originals? Yeah, but I don't watch it like I used to. Like, so I have like every version of it because I'm a, a, you know, a corporation's dream. of Because back then I had every version from like the TV version, the wide box because back then everything wasn't widescreen so I have like every version of it but they they ruined Luke Skywalker and then they're kind of doing it to most of the heroes if you pay attention they they're purposefully I think it's purposefully like I don't know how she could explain it like here was the the guy that brought hope to the galaxy he was uplifting he thought he could change the most evil man in the galaxy and then by you get time you get to episode eight he's drinking milk from a sea creature and he's all in his beard and he's throwing lights it was just garbage it was just like and, and they and they told you ahead of time in the in the commercial they said take the past and kill it you gotta destroy it and so that's what they did they destroyed everything about the first three star wars and really the first six star wars because i guess that's was seven eight and nine anyway so once that happened i've pretty much Hollywood is dead to me because they ruined Luke Skywalker. Today has been a good day with you, Steve. I Dude, messed up the Battle of Gonzales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're brittle today, right? Like you've, you've been brooding over that, and and now I'm, and now you're now you're on you're on it. <laughs> but you know, like I have an awesome. That's a Thailand version of Die Hard over there. Best Christmas movie ever. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I, I. That was so earlier. We're so. We're, Talk, we'll finish up the show with this. It's positive for us in a way. So yesterday we went to shooting league. So we missed a week before because it was graduation, so we get to make up. So the first time we went up to shoot, Steve won, and I was I was close. Hey, Tim and Rob. So yeah, was... and we both beat Rob. So that was like <laughs> that was perfect. And then the second time we shot for the makeup, we started at 25 yards and went forward. Yeah. Which I guess Jimmy was saying a lot of people were crying about it because they didn't like it, which I liked it because I can't see it 25 yards. So as I get closer, things are looking up. Yeah. <laughs> Normally it's looking worse as you back up. So um, I shot a 257 out of 360. So that was my best. Rob came back and got a 290. Yeah, he did pretty good. But I shot pretty my well. best. But I'm, I'm going to give you some professional advice, not that you need it. Never buy Russian ammo. This stupid Russian round right here cost me points because it's steel jacketed and it jammed up. So I didn't get my last round off from jammed up three you didn't yards. Have a proper grip. That's why. <laughs> oh, is that what it was? Lip wrist in it. Yeah, you got to hold the pistol like a man, dude. I did get corrected on that by the who was that behind me? Um, you were lip wrist in it. Well, on the one, the one where we started at the twenty-five yards back for whatever reason. 
And I felt it because, number one, I hit the very left side edge of the target. Like, I mean, barely. Like, there's little nips of it. And he came up to me, and it was embarrassing because I was an expert with my Beretta 9 mil, which in the Army, you know, it's a whole silhouette. It's not right. the center. You just got to hit from waist to head. Anyway, um, but, yeah, I... I he, he he told me that my brother afterwards, of course, because the competitive Morris is like, God, man, you getting talked to like you're a private, never picked up a weapon before. I was like, well, I shot like it on those first six, and I, I needed to hear that. But it was good advice. Like, he reminded me to jam my, um, this part up into the... The tang of the pistol. The tang, you know, and once I did that, it was, I was back kind of, but it was too late. Yeah, right. Because the first after he told me that, I had a little bit of pride. I'm like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. And then I was the like, time things. When I was watching, and it was like basically almost coming up to my face. And I was like, yeah, I need to yeah, squat a little your hand, bit. Get your hand. What are, you, what are you running a Beretta? No, I have a Glock. No, it's a Ruger, Ruger Nine Security. Okay. Now, if I had a Beretta, I'd probably be like Wild Bill Hickok out there. Let's go buy a Beretta. Sharp uncle, get you. I one. gotta buy a rifle for the elk hunt. Yeah, I'm saving my money up for that. I've actually changed my grip a little bit over the years. So like my my support hand, I actually run it a little bit further forward, like as opposed to just. Is that what my Rob hands. said he did yesterday? I I run my my support hand a little bit higher up and a little forward of my my dominant hand, and on a Glock, on the on the front rail, there's actually like a. It feels like there's a place to put your thumb, and the thing is, is that like you control the recoil a lot better. It's a lot more stable. And um, if you don't put your thumb there, no, by yeah, oh. by by running your your support hand a little bit higher up and further forward, you're actually putting more support on the pistol, so you're managing the recoil a little bit better. I'll have to let and Rob. You know, have a, he has a Glock that yeah. he hates. Yeah, he I said he's hand. not very accurate with yeah. it. He hates the Glock. My dad gave it to him. My dad won in a raffle. There's in no Texas. such thing as hating a Glock, dude. But Rob dislikes we... his Glock. Okay. <laughs> Why? But I will I will share that yeah. tip with him. And... No, no, we won't. Well, he's not shooting with a Glock. Remember, he's using a oh, okay. H and K. No, that's right. Because he can't find a clip for. Her. That's what's funny. He's, he don't have extra clips, so he has to reload each. Oh, round. that's a bummer. Not really. He shoots better than us, and so we're like, God, look at him over there. I'm like, Come on, Morris, let's go. Yeah, I'm trying to put some pressure on him, make him <laughs> yes. embarrassed that we're all waiting on him. <laughs> <laughs> I will say though, you Chiefs can shoot because Jimmy's like the best at the league, and then Tim is also apparently really good yeah, too. Yeah, Tim's a good shooter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, that, that's confidence too for us as lowly civilians, right? Knowing that you guys can. Yeah, put... Chiefs don't shoot, dog. I know. We, we shoot. They bills. have to retire first. We, we shoot bills. You <laughs> shoot bills and paperwork. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I can shoot. I um, I can shoot before I retire. I just. There's too much going on this spring, this summer, next year. Nice. It's fun. I'm glad we signed up because it's yeah, so it, much fun. It is a good time. It is. You know, it's, uh, you know, 100. I was telling Tom, it's so. good to know that we have 150 or less, somewhere around there of us, that actually can put targets, you know. Yeah, steel on, on target, paper. Yeah. So it's it's good to see that out there. And yeah, and I like it's the, men and women. the ball breaking and, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the camaraderie of it. It's a good time. Yeah, it's good to no know. No pressure because... I'm not there to win, so. You're there to have fun, which exactly. I still have yet to understand this concept of having fun just for the sake of it. No, dude. <laughs> Life is about winning and losing. <laughs> do, hard, do hard things. You guys are always picking yourselves apart about everything, and I'm like, whatever. Shot 257. Chief would be all like, oh, man, what a horrible day. I'm like, look at that. All but one bullet hit the freaking right spot. <laughs> I'm not kidding. If I went and, you know, last year, I say I was – shooting clean and i i dumped one out of the 10 like it would ruin like days oh i know you know so like i could shoot like a 358 359 and like i would be in you know a grumpy mood for days yeah when i was in the army there was a guy from of texas allegedly and it took him four tries to qualify so I, and he outranked me. I went up to him. I was like, uh, "Sir, I need to see your driver's license." And he handed it to me. And I was like, "You'll get this back when you learn how to shoot." And <laughs> just because I was like, "Man, you can't be from Texas," because everybody knows the Texans, right? Yeah. We talked about it before, and uh, 
you know, he's all of those big Texas guys, and then it's like, uh, I, I heard from the range crew that it took you four tries, five tries to qualify, so you get this back when you learn how to shoot, man, or stop acting like you're from Texas. Anyway, it was, I mean, I, I carry it on everywhere, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a lifestyle, Tim. It is. It makes you you, though. That's why you <laughs> brood over not remembering a name of a battle. Well, especially because my uncle just corrected my brother on it. And, well, actually, I don't think he corrected him because he didn't want him to be embarrassed. So if yeah. you're watching this, Rob, you were wrong. It's the Battle of Gonzales. You should be very The first battle of the Texas Revolution. But anyway. All right. Well, thank you, Chief. Thanks, guys. We'll get you for a couple more weeks anyways. Roger that. We're happy for you. Thanks. Sad for the town. We're going to yeah, lose you. Cool. But it's an awesome accomplishment for you and your family. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. We'll heck you, heckle you tonight in your crowd. Yeah, please do. Please do. All right, guys, for the Tim and Steve show, we'll see you tomorrow.